What were your career ambitions when you were growing up? Well, I didn't actually have any career ambitions when I was growing up. Sort of the, the early part of my life, I left school fairly early actually, about late 15, almost 16, and all I was interested in doing was surfing. So I spent probably the first six years uh, after that just, just really sort of chasing waves around Australia and Indonesia and places like that. Then I got to about 22 and decided, well, I needed to do something with my life. And then I spent the next couple of years sort of uh, searching for that. And then about 25, I arrived on computing. And it was sort of intuitive in those days because there were very, very few computers around. But once I got into computing, it was something I really enjoyed, seemed to have an aptitude for it as well. And then my life just took off from there. So originally went and worked for a computing company, uh, did that for a number of years. Could see some uh, holes in their offerings, particularly in terms of being able to understand what was happening internally inside the computers, uh, in, particularly in terms of the performance of them. So developed some computer products and they became internationally successful and uh, established my first company and uh, that would have been about at the age of 32, I think. By 37 I'd made enough money to retire. Certainly successful in technology, it sounds like you really loved it. What are some of your big achievements when you were in that field? Oh, well, I think probably the things which really mattered to me most was one, creating a public listed company called Integrated Research, which is a public listed on the Australian Stock Exchange got the New South Wales and also the Australian Exporter of the Year. And when we got them, for me, that was really a superb achievement. I think it was about 1998 when we got those awards. What made you think of peace? In many ways, I'm an accidental man of peace. And really, and it's the story of my life. Things just seem to happen, see opportunity, and I just do follow it. And it's a bit like that with peace. So sort of after sort of establishing my computer companies, so you've made quite a bit of money, so I set up a, a family foundation. And seeing I'd spent so much time in uh, yeah, some wild places surfing, I had a real empathy with the, quite often with the poorest of the poor, because quite often you're surfing in places that you're surrounded by abject poverty. And so I decided to work with the poorest of the poor. So what that meant, that was a lot of it's in working in conflict zones, near post war zones, places like that. It was in northeast Kivu in the Congo, uh, looking at some projects we were planning on doing there, actually with fistula chairs. Then I started to think, what's the opposite of all these places, stressed out places I'm spending time in? What are the most peaceful nations in the world? And is there anything I can learn from them to bring back to the projects I was doing? So it's a little bit of a fantasy question, if you like. Search the internet and couldn't find a list of the nations of the world ranked by their peacefulness. And I thought, well, wow, that's a really important thing to do. And that's how the Global Peace Index came about. But I guess it's something really profound in that, because if a simple businessman like myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations in the world and it hasn't been done, then how much do we actually know about peace? Think about running a business. If you can't measure something, can you understand it? If you can't measure it, how do you know whether your actions are even helping you or hindering you in achieving your goals? You don't. Then the more I got into actually looking at peace, I realised very, very little real study of the empiric studies of peace. Most of it's sort of a qualitative, and a lot of that's very, very good, but the quantitative stuff is also very, very important. And then I also realised that mainly when we're looking and talking about peace, we're not talking about peace, we're talking about conflict, we're studying conflict. And that peace, as we really do profoundly find out later on, what creates and sustains peace is very, very different than what you need to do to stop conflict. There are so many challenges that we still have around the world. Like if you look at biodiversity, availability of fresh water, you're looking at climate change and everything else that you can think of, how can peace be used to actually overcome some of those challenges? Well, if you think about it, peace is exactly what we need if we ever hope to have any hope of being able to tackle these problems. Because unless we have a world which is basically peaceful, we'll never get the levels of trust, 
cooperation or inclusiveness necessary to solve these problems. Therefore, peace is a prerequisite for the survival of society as we know it in the 21st century. And that is different than any other epoch in human history. In the past, peace may have been the domain of the altruistic, but in the 21st century, it's in everyone's self-interest. How can a business develop a culture where peace can be the goal, not just for the organisation, but for society? Well, I think we've got a large role in education uh, for people to actually really understand the economics of peace. Because what we do know is that there's a monetary value associated with improvements in peace. For example, the cost of violence to the global economy in 2018 was almost $15 trillion. If we got a 10% reduction in that, then that would be equivalent to, the, to adding the three new countries to the world, the size of the Iceland, uh, Norway and Ireland. Another way of looking at it too is that if we look at all the overseas investments or foreign capital which is invested in all the various countries around the world, that is the same size, $1.5 trillion. In fact, even 1% of the cost of violence to the global economy is the equivalent of all overseas developmental aid last year. And I guess another way of being, coming at, being able to look at this is just as we start to now look at societies which are highly peaceful compared to those which are less peaceful. So we took the 20, top 25% of the global peace index, for example, and compared it to the bottom 25%. Over the last 60 years, the countries in the top 25% on average have had 3% per annum higher GDP growth rate. In fact, we find with the concept positive peace, which is the attitudes, institutions and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies, as they improve, they're associated with superior form performance in five different macroeconomic indicators, such as GDP growth, which I've mentioned, uh, inflation rates, interest rates, exchange rates, and foreign direct investment. So the argument, the actual financial argument for peace is exceptionally strong, but not enough people know it or actually understand it today. Can one individual make a difference? Well, the question, put another way, is can one individual make a difference to what? So certainly one individual can make a difference to the people around them and that they interface and connect with. Be simple, if you want to look at it from the angle of peace, it's simple as when you go into a store and you buy a coffee in the morning, smile at the person on the other end, say something pleasant to them rather than complain about the service. How would you relate the metrics that you gather to peaceful relationships between each person in family and in the community? Well, I think a lot of the time individuals live within a society, okay, and sort of a lot of the measurements we do, let's say, are at the, the level of the uh, nation, state, or the country. So the metrics of when you're looking at homicide, every homicide affects an individual, the family of that individual, and all their friends. Same as a violent crime. Other things like state-sponsored terror on its citizens, so that has a flow-on effect right through society. So that'd be things like extrajudicial killing, torture, imprisonment without trial. So I think each time there's a stat, and this is the problem with stats sometimes, there's an individual story behind it, behind it. So if we come back, we look at the individual, okay? So question, okay, it's old as time itself, is do individuals create the society or does the society create the individuals? And my view on it anyway is it's neither. It's an interplay between the two. The society shapes the people and the people shape the society. So really to be able to transform societies and make them more peaceful, you need to be able to work at both levels, from the societal level down. That's those structures, attitudes and institutions uh, which cre create and sustain peaceful societies like positive peace. But it's also, they're appropriate, they're now developing the people from the bottom up in terms of giving them, supporting them when they've got issues and problems so they don't end up be committing suicide, let's say, or with high levels of uh, mental disease and stress. So that societal su 
support of the individual when they're in trouble and in need is really important. And then there's the interactions which come. The interactions come through the family, or they can come from the schools. They're all, or from their uh, uh, siblings, or from their friends. So all these interactions, how do you actually create them so that they actually build resilience within people? So when people get hit with something, or with a problem, that they've actually got the internal fortitude to be able to stand up to rectify rather than feeling a victim and then looking for blame and then looking for retribution. What has the Institute for Economics and Peace seen as an opportunity for positive peace to accelerate and be ingrained in human behaviour? The opportunity where we see and what we're finding uh, you're having stunning success with too is the concept of actually sort of being able to get workshops around it with, with small groups, particularly youth, young leaders. And one of the great relationships we've got is with Rotary and Rotary International. So we've been working with them for the last four years and now they're rolling these positive peace workshops out all around the world and so through their 35,000 clubs. And we've had some stunning successes out of one. one. One which comes to mind, it's a little bit lengthy but I'll tell the story anyway, <laughs> it was in Uganda. So we ran a, 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 a positive peace workshop there for a, a, a about 200, 300 rotor actors. And then there was a follow-up one for that. And about 18 months later, I was in Uganda, and I thought, oh, let's go and have a look at a couple of the outcomes of a couple of these uh, yeah, yeah, clubs we've been working with. And there was a gentleman called Jude, who we caught up as a school teacher, And his local Rotary Club had a, 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 a project, which they've been running for two years, for uh, yeah, literacy in a very, very poor school in Uganda. And this is the bottom half of the bottom billion, like this is really, re really as poor as you can imagine. Well, maybe not quite that poor, but it's poor. And so we went out and visited the school and uh, Jude said, well, we did the Positive Peace Workshop and we've been working on the literacy for a couple of years and it was, it was a good project, but when we started to look at it through the lens of Positive Peace through the eight different pillars, we came up with an intervention for each pillar. None of the interventions were particularly uh, uh, new, but because it was holistic, it made a real difference. And I'll just give you two of them. I'll just give you two. So one of them was sort of was in the accept one of these pillars is acceptance of the rights of others. So a lot of girls weren't coming to school when they're menstruating. So what they did was introduce sanitary pads. Simple. So the local Rotary Club supplied the sanitary pads for for, for the for the women or for the girls. So that then picked the attendance rates up. And then the other thing is good relationships with neighbours. And so this school was set in a rural environment. And at lunchtime, the kids would go out and they'd be raiding all the fruit trees in all the neighbouring properties. And you can imagine in these kind of places, every apple and every orange really counts. So what they did then is planted fruit trees in the yard. But the underlying cause, reason why they're doing this is because they're hungry, because they, they, their families haven't got enough money to give them a, a, a food to go to lunch with. So they introduced a porridge a, a feeding at lunchtime. And like that was this a couple of cents per kid. But 
That then gave them nutritional value. What it meant was in the afternoons now, they had a lot more concentration. So what we found through these interventions and others, the attendance rate at the school went up 40% because kids had, parents had now been motivated to send the kids to school for rather than trying to get them to go and scratch out a living. And what we also found was that now the scholastic rate went from being in the bottom 50% of the district to about the 30 percentile mark. So these are, these, are, these are big improvements. So just to drive it home, like the literacy rates in these kind of places can be as low as 8 or 9 percent. What can future generations do to become advocates for peace? Peace in many ways is really, really very, very simple. It can start with your interaction with an individual, or it can start with the way the organisations you join, and it can start with the various attitudes which and learnings which you do yourself. It's complicated, it's complicated, but things like positive peace, uh, introducing, getting involved in sort of being able to develop the positive peace within a society is a great way to start in terms of being able to try and transform sections of society so they become more peaceful. So if we look at concepts like positive peace, uh, they're systemic. So if we're looking at it, we'd see, you've got to look at things from a systemic effect and you can apply it within a school. See the school as a system. What are the things which you could do to make that school more, pe that school more peaceful? If you had uh, to speak to the new generation, the future generations, if you selected three key points that you think they should remember going towards peace, what would they be? What sort of things would you tell them they should remember or do? The first thing is think of things as being systemic, not in terms of cause and effect. We always think about things being cause effect. Here's the problem, okay, that's the cause, fix the cause and the problem goes away. And it's partially true. But societies operate more as a system and cause and effect, it's about events. It's a bit like Trump getting elected in the US, that's an event. From a system perspective, it's more the relationships and flows. How do you get the right relationships and flows to correct the underlying conditions which cause the problem? If you get the right relationships and flows, now you've got a system, if you like, which will keep improving as it moves on. So in other words, it's locked in a virtuous cycle, ever self-improving. So the first thing I think is just for peace is just really understand things from a systems perspective. The second thing is a lot of the time people creating peace can be come up from a cause-based perspective and causes are good so I'm not saying causes are bad but a lot of the time it can be generated with the your own self of own sense of self-righteousness uh, uh, which comes with a can anger uh, uh, and judgment that's not peace, that's not peace. The question is like, really, how do you go about positive change coming from positive energy within yourself? So that'd be the second thing I'd say. The third thing is sort of systems related again. We're not independent and divorced from everything around it. We're all part of an interconnected self, if you like. And like, what's important is our role and the way we play into that fabric rather than trying to rip the fabric to suit us. What a great, great message to the people from you. Thank you, Steve.